Ladies and gentlemen, this is a warning. Thank you. August 1967 was a tumultuous time in America's history. The Vietnam War was still raging on. The leader of the American Nazi Party was assassinated in Virginia. And race riots across the country that began the month prior had just spread to Washington, D.C. and New Haven, Connecticut. But for the African Americans of Stamford, a small city between New York and New Haven, another terror was about to begin. Beginning in August 1967 and lasting for four years, the bodies of five African American women would be found in the woods within a quarter mile radius of the Riverbank Road overpass along the Merritt Parkway north of town. Most of them were known sex workers, and most of them were strangled with their own bras, leading the media to dub them the Bra Murders. Though there would be an arrest in the case, many believe the killer of these five women is still uncaptured goes on in San Francisco for the man known as the Zodiac Killer. There could be a serial killer in Chicago. The Oakland County child killer. Phantom killer. Frankfurt slasher. Four children have now been murdered. Has killed five and says he's going to kill again. Fifteen brutally murdered young women. The pattern is the same. One by one. The death count started rising. A man in a mask robbed, tied, and stabbed them. Strangled, stuck in burlap bags. It is highly unlikely that these women were murdered by separate Man. Where will the killer strike next? The police can't answer who or why. That's the question that we'll never know. I don't want to live the rest of my life wondering if this person's going to be caught. I believe that there's someone out there that has knowledge. And he's probably still at large. It was August 4th when 29-year-old Rose Ellen Pazda went missing from her home in the South End neighborhood of New Haven. The divorced mother of one was known as Sissy Rush on the streets and didn't even make a mention in the papers. Good evening. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, 39 years old and a Nobel Peace Prize winner, and the leader of the nonviolent civil rights movement in the United States was assassinated in Memphis tonight. A sniper's bullet cut down Dr. King as he stood on a hotel balcony in Memphis. The nation was shocked. President Johnson expressed horror and then postponed his trip to Hawaii until tomorrow. After Martin Luther King's assassination in May of the following year, the nation was plunged back into riots. And though Stanford was a primarily white city, it was no different. It was during this chaos that 22-year-old Donna Roberts was reported missing on May 2nd from the boarding house she had been living in for the past few months that is now where Mill River Playground sits. Just two months prior, Donna had appeared before the circuit court to testify for her boyfriend in a robbery with violence charge. It was just before 4 p.m. the following day when a police officer spotted what he thought was a dummy in the bushes off of westbound Merritt Parkway near the Riverbank Road overpass. Lying face up was the body of Donna. She had been beaten about her face and body, her right leg broken, and finally strangled to death with her own bra. Then, on September 8th that year, a motorist was driving on the highway when she spotted a pair of legs sticking out from behind a tree just past the Den Road exit. The woman's body was lying just 200 feet east from where Donna had been dumped. Her mouth had been taped shut and her hands were tied behind her back. Again, she had been strangled with her own bra. Being that it was a highway, state police were involved in the cases and within two days had identified the victim as 21-year-old Gloria Kahn from Mount Vernon, New York. Known as Pete, Gloria had a record for selling drugs and had not been living in her mother's home for a number of months. Police stated it was improbable that the two cases were not linked, but after that things went silent as the Vietnam War protests reached their height one month later. It was 3.30 a.m. on Good Friday the following year when police received a phone call. The caller identified himself as Reverend James Miller of Darien and said he had received a call about an hour prior for someone saying there's a body near the Merritt Parkway. As it is Holy Week, the body should get a Christian burial. 
two police were assigned to walk the woods, and 150 feet west of the riverbank overpass, they came upon an old stone wall. Behind it, under four or five large stones, was a skeleton. Its skull would be found nearby with a few teeth left that helped identify it as the body of Rose Pazda. Nineteen-year-old Gail Thompson had dropped out of Stamford High School as a junior in December 1970. Like the others, she had begun working the sex trade and was last seen talking to a man in a convertible at 12.30 a.m. Saturday, July 10, 1971. A driver the next morning was approaching the Riverbank Road overpass on eastbound Merritt Parkway when they saw something red on the side of the road. It turned out to be the clothes of Gail, and her body was just past that. She had been strangled with a handkerchief that was also left nearby. Finally, police announced there was a possible connection to the three previous murders, but they were still treating them as separate homicides. Just over a month later, 34-year-old Alma Henry stormed out of her apartment in the Southfield Village housing project in Stamford. Torn down in 1993 after the shooting of a seven-year-old girl at a birthday party, Southfield Village was known by police as the most dangerous subsidized housing complex in the city. Today, the grounds have become the Southwood Square Apartments. The following Sunday morning, August 22nd, two men driving to the Jets vs. Giants football game in New Haven pulled over right here where a rest stop used to be on the eastbound side of the highway. Though it has been gone for a number of years, you can still see the indentation where the trees are still growing back over time. But back in 1971, they used to sit 66 feet back from the road, and just 4 feet past that, the men spotted the body of Alma. She had tape wrapped around her head as a gag, and part of her clothes were found at the rest stop. She would have beaten and then strangled with her bra. Her body location was directly across the highway from where Gail had been found. But there was also a difference this time. Alma lived with her husband and four children. Her neighbors stated it was unbelievable that she could have been a prostitute. Was the killer branching out, or was there a copycat? An increasingly frustrated community formed the concerned citizens of Black Stamford to petition the disservice they felt the case was being given compared to if the murder victims had been whites. In fact, they pointed to the previous year's murder of 17-year-old Joanne Fiore, whose case had been solved in just a matter of a few months. Joanne lived with her parents on the third floor of this apartment high-rise. Usually, she met a fellow classmate at the elevator and rode it down each morning, but on February 18th, that friend had already left, so Joanne used the stairs. It was not long after that another tenant would find her body in the second floor level. She'd been stabbed 24 times. Being that her father had been in the police force for nearly 30 years, a reward that would eventually reach $3,000 was put up for information on the murder, and a special phone line was also set up. She was not the first victim to die by knife in Stamford recently either. In September 1969, after smelling a strange odor coming from the lockers at the Stamford Penn Central Railway Station, a porter would find the torso of a young woman wrapped inside a suitcase. The following day, her arms and legs would be found stuffed into the trash can of the men's bathroom. Fingerprints would match those of Margaret Mary Warburton, a 20-year-old from Montreal, Canada, who had recently come to New York City to visit relatives. Last seen on September 18th to go to a shopping trip in Manhattan, she had been strangled and then dismembered. Then, on May 28th, 1970, two months after Fiore was murdered, a child was walking down Echo Hill Road in North Stamford to the swamp at the end when they found a corpse lying in the water. 
it would turn out to be the body of 27-year-old Anna Calmira Solanila. Though she had been stabbed multiple times, the coroner would identify the cause of death to be strangulation. Born in Colombia, Anna had come to the U.S. in 1964 and was currently working as a maid in Pound Ridge, New York, just across the state line. Then, on August 29, 1970, a 13-year-old girl was walking on Newfield Avenue when 16-year-old Bruce Salmon rushed up behind her and began to beat her with a wooden plank. The screaming drew a group of kids who chased down the attacker. Bruce would be committed for observation to the Fairfield Hills State Hospital, and while there, he would give information that connected him to the murder of Joanne Fiore. Salomon would eventually be found not guilty by reason of insanity. In the Solanilla case, police would arrest 25-year-old Dominic Telesco, but a grand jury refused to indict him, believing they could not adequately convict him. The case of Margaret Warburton has been hinted as being a possible victim of the Times Square torso killer, Richard Cottingham. Meanwhile, after the formation of the Concerned Citizens of Black Stamford, Stamford Police Chief Joseph Kinsella would ask the state police to set up what he referred to as the Bra Bureau, a dedicated phone line for tips, and the governor authorized a $3,000 reward. They would conduct 1,200 interviews, follow 56 good suspects, and whittle that down to about six prime suspects. Meanwhile, they had continued to look into all clergymen with the name Miller, which led them to 42-year-old Norwalk resident Benjamin Franklin Miller. Police had originally requested Miller to come in for an interview in 1969, but he had written them asking it to be delayed as he was busy making home visits for the Christmas season. They would not get back to him until January 1972, when they began interviewing his ex-wife and co-workers. Learning that soon after moving to Connecticut from Illinois in 1948, he would be sent on and off to psychiatric hospitals beginning three years later for a variety of issues. He would often report feeling anxious, fearful, agitated, or depressed. He said he was haunted by obsessive thoughts, had insomnia, and was a hypochondriac. In 1962, he got a job as a clerk at the United States Postal Service in Darien, and soon thereafter became a sidewalk preacher in his free time. The self-confessed fan of Billy Graham, he would often focus on young African American women and children in his speeches. And while sorting mail, he would often add his own religious pamphlets. Between late 1971 and early 1972, police interviewed Miller a number of times. He refused to admit to the killings, but did say he had intercourse with Gail Thompson in his car. Forensics showed she had not had sex prior to her death, though when he was shown photos of her corpse, he made a startling statement. He said she had been strangled with a handkerchief. This was one of the few items withheld by police to prove their case, as the news had stated all five had been strangled with their bras. He would agree to a polygraph test, which proved inconclusive due to his mental illness, and he would be committed to Fairfield Hills Hospital. After a few months, Miller came forward to his doctors with a statement. He wanted to confess to police. On February 29, 1972, he gave a detailed confession of Thompson's murder and stated he had killed six others. A few days later, police took him to the crime scenes where he reenacted the murders, leading him to be arrested in front of the hospital two weeks later for all five killings. But it was hardly a slam dunk. The concerned citizens group said they believed Miller to be just a scapegoat. Miller himself would recant his confession during his trial, and his father took the stand saying his son told him police had forced him to confess with threats of violence or taking his family and job away. One year after his arrest, two of the murder charges would be dropped, and Miller would be found not guilty by reason of insanity in the other three, receiving a 25-year sentence to a state hospital. Police were satisfied, however, and lead detective George Mayer would state to his dying day Miller was guilty. In 
In 1980, Mayer would be one of the multiple detectives from around the country brought in to help solve the Atlanta child murders, another case dubiously claimed to be solved. Despite their son freed, Miller's family wasn't willing to let things rest and hired lawyers to study the case. In their research, they discovered police had another suspect that had not been disclosed. In July 1972, Robert Lupinacci was arrested as he was attempting to strangle a prostitute in the neighborhood just off the highway from where the other murders had occurred. Despite being a known bigot, he would spend most of his time wandering the city's red light districts and knew many prostitutes and pimps. He was described as being obsessed with sex. Where he was arrested was within 100 feet of where three of the women were dumped, and his car had been spotted several times around the crime scenes. He also frequented the bars on the outskirts of Port Chester, New York, where one of the victims was also known to frequent. He was also seen at the Hazelton Hotel and reported he had stayed in the same hotel room another one of the victims had rented out previously. He was a member of the German American Club that was in the Grey Rocks Place neighborhood where Alma Henry had disappeared. But again, it was Gail Thompson's murder that had the most evidence. Lupinacci worked in the same motel where Gail lived. Inside his car, police found a pornographic deck of cards that had the Queen of Hearts missing, the same type of car that was found near her body. Strands of hair belonging to African American women were found in his trunk. But at that time, no such testing existed to link it to a particular person. In 1982, Miller's attorney filed a motion for retrial, which was finally accepted in 1988. After considering the coercive tactics by police and his mental issues, Miller was fully acquitted. Until his death in 2010, Miller lived in a homeless shelter for the mentally ill due to his incapability of adapting to society. Lupinacci only admitted to the assault he was jailed for. After his release, he married, had children, and worked as an electrician until passing away in 2013. The lead investigator on the case, George Mayer, remained adamant that Miller was the single killer of all five women until his own death in 2013. Who was the bra murderer of Stanford? seems highly unlikely that separate killers would use the same exact dumping ground and murder method. Over the past 50 years, Stanford has continued to grow. Much of the city redeveloped as it has become the second largest in the state. But a new coat of paint and bigger buildings still doesn't cover the fact that five or more of the city's residents were murdered decades ago. Their cases seemingly forgotten about by many, while their unknown killer appears to have walked free.